Hi everyone, welcome to this webinar on climate displacement and migration, uh, challenges, politics, and solutions. My name is Michaela. I'm a student representative of the Green Impact Team at LSE's Department of Social Policy. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon for a much needed discussion on the migration climate nexus, which has thus far received far less attention and scrutiny than it deserves. And we've assembled a range of experts from human rights, legal, policy, academic, and humanitarian aid backgrounds to not only provide a critical introductory overview of climate migration within various global and regional contexts, but also to promote a solutions-oriented discussion about ways forward. Before I hand it over to Dr. Isabel Schutz, this event's chair, who will do some housekeeping, introduce the speakers, and facilitate the conversation here on out, I'd like to speak on behalf of my team, as well as the lovely Earth Refuge team, some of whom you will hear from today. Um, this event is a collaboration between both teams. It's the second installment of the Green Impact Team speaker series, which aims to bridge the academic gap between environmental and social policy. And you can find all our past and upcoming speaker series events on LLC Social Policies YouTube. To keep up to date with our other initiatives, you can follow our social media accounts, which are on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Now, Earth Refuge is the planet's first legal think tank dedicated to climate migrants. The organization works with impacted communities at the grassroots level, believes that solutions to climate migration should be community-led and utilizes its legal approach to facilitate this. This organization is home to the world's only legal base of database of case law, ranging across jurisdictions, presidents, persuasive authorities, and topics, analyzed creative, creative, ah, creatively through a climate migration lens. Earth Refuge informs and educates on the consequences of climate change to secure legal protection and assistance for climate migrants through legal research, education, and advocacy. This is a mouthful. I'll include all this information in an email to attendees following this webinar. And another thing I'd like to note is that due to um, an unforeseen and un unavoidable situation, our original chair is unwell and could not make it today, but um, Dr. Schutz has come in and saved the day. She's equally impressive and she's equally experienced. And as this was short notice, she will have to leave a little bit early sometime during the Q&A due to prior engagements, as will one of our speakers, Dr. Samudu Atapatu. But um, she'll hand over the Q&A and conclusion back to me, and we'll try to make this transition as seamless as possible. Um, I ask for your, your understanding, and thank you. Um, now I'll hand it over to Dr. Isabel Schutz, an associate professor in the Department of Social Policy. She's the program director of the Master's in International Social and Public Policy and teaches a range of undergraduate and postgraduate courses. Her research, which has been published in numerous academic journals, examines the intersections of migration and social policies, social divisions and inequalities relating to citizenship and immigration status, and the implications for care, employment, social rights, and social provision. All right. Thank you very much, Michaela, and um, a huge thanks to all our speakers and panelists for joining us today uh, in addressing, obviously, the critical issue of uh, climate migration and um, legal solutions to addressing climate migration. So um, I'll just run through uh, a few housekeeping um, issues and then I'll introduce the speakers and uh, say a few words um, about everybody joining us. Uh, and then we'll have essentially a series of uh, talks from some of you uh, followed by a panel which is designed to be more sort of dialogue uh, amongst our panelists in addressing what sort of solutions we might envisage to address uh, legal uh, protections for climate migrants. So um, firstly, to remind everybody, uh, the uh, seminar will be recorded, so that recording will be made uh, available. There are live captions for those of you who wish to uh, use them. And uh, you will have the opportunity, of course, to put your questions to our speakers and panelists. Um, so that will be possible following. Uh, so if you have questions after our speakers have spoken, um, please put your questions through. But we'll address those questions at the end following our panel uh, discussion. OK, so just to say a few words of introduction to everybody, uh, we're joined today by uh, Lauren Grant. Welcome, Lauren. So Lauren is the Director of Field Research at Earth Refuge, where she specifically coordinates research on climate migration across uh, the globe. And joining 
uh, Lauren from uh, um, Earth Refuge is Yumna Kamel, who's the executive director and indeed the co-founder of Earth Refuge. Uh, we also have with us Dr. Samudu Atapatu, uh, who is a professor and director of research centers and international programs at the University of Wisconsin Law School. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Atapatu, for joining us. And uh, we will be joined in our um, panel uh, following our speakers with um, Dr. Tasneem Siddiqui, who is Professor of Political Science at the University of uh, Dhaka and founding chair of uh, the Refugee and Migratory Movements uh, Research Unit uh, in Bangladesh. Welcome, Dr. Siddiqui. And also um, by Atle Solberg, who is head of the Secretariat of the Platform on, Dis on Disaster Displacement, uh, Adle is a political scientist from Norway and was the head of the Nasnan Initiative Secretariat, um, which predecessed the uh, platform on disaster displacement. So welcome to you all. Uh, we will start um, then with our um, series of, of uh, speakers, um, kicking off with uh, Lauren. So thank you for having me here today, um, and thank you, of course, to the um, to the LSE Social Policy Green Impact Team, and to Earth Refuge, of course, for for co-hosting the event. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here alongside all of the panelists. Um, I'm going to try to be very brief. I only have ten minutes, and I probably have a lot more material than that. Um, but I want to kind of provide an overview of what is this thing that we call climate migration. What are some of the trends and realities that we're seeing? Um, and, and how are we you know, problematizing this and some of the challenges associated with that in an effort to then respond to it, to try to kind of get us set up for the um, solutions oriented dialogue during the latter part of the session today. So uh, to just jump right in, um, today more people are displaced worldwide than have ever been before. The UNHCR just released uh, new numbers in the last week or two that we have about 100 million people displaced globally at the moment. Um, and today, disasters are the leading driver of displacement globally. And they overtook conflict and persecution drivers of displacement in 2001 um, for the first time. And today, uh, individuals are three times more likely to be displaced related to the impacts of climate change and disasters than they are by conflict or persecution related drivers. Uh, between 2008 and 2021, we've seen an average of about 25 million people displaced each year um, related to weather events, um, which equates to about 67,000 displacements each day, or as Environmental Justice Foundation has pointed out, about 41 people per minute. Um, importantly, climate change has, has often hit the poorest regions of the world first and worst. Um, those who are uh, least responsible for the production of emissions that have led to the warming of our planet. Uh, and it has particular disproportionate impacts on women and girls. And it's also quite significant that half of the most climate vulnerable regions in the world at the moment are active sites of conflict uh, or related crises, uh, with Africa being the prime example at the moment, currently home to over uh, half of the world's uh, active sites of conflict. Um, so I also wanted to pull up, let's see, I wanted to pull up this map from IDMC, which is often um, uh, cited when we talk about climate-induced displacement. This map focuses um, specifically on internal displacement as opposed to cross-border displacement, as this is not data that we have at the moment. Um, but essentially the orange blurbs here represent displacement by conflict and the blue displacement by disasters. Um, so what we can see from this map, uh, kind of key points, that the distribution of displacement is actually quite global um, and that disaster displacement is highly concentrated um, in the South Asian region and the Pacific, um, as well as the Americas um, and, and to a lesser extent in Europe. Um, we saw 23.7 million disaster related displacements in 2021 with the top five countries in the world with the highest internal displacement um, numbers related to disaster being Afghanistan with 1.4 million displacements, China right behind it with a million, the Philippines, Ethiopia and South Sudan following. The other thing of note is that the, the intersection between these bubbles of um, conflict and violence and uh, disaster induced displacement has been increasing over the years. Uh, again, Africa serving as, as an example of this here. 
Um, for those who don't cross borders, though, um, again, most displacement happens internally, but for those who do cross borders, sorry, um, often they still kind of stay within their local regions. And another really important point here is that people are just as likely to migrate to um, places of environmental vulnerability as away from them. Um, so I also wanted to highlight the kind of breakdown provided by the IDMC in its recent um, data, which came out just last month. Um, the disasters have triggered more than 60% of internal displacement reported worldwide in 2021. Um, and that through the global breakdown of hazards here, we see that roughly 94% of disaster displacement is weather related as opposed to geophysical, uh, with storms and floods serving as the leading driver of disaster induced displacement. Um, I also wanted to, to pull up this data from 2016, um, just to emphasize really the, the magnitude of what one or two storms can actually cause in terms of the numbers of displacement. Uh, so we see from this graph just two typhoons in the Philippines alone displacing up, upwards of 5 million people uh, in 2016 with the Yangtze River floods, um, about, about 2 million people in China in that same year, and about a million people displaced uh, related to storms in India and Cuba in the same time period. So we're talking very high volumes of people displaced, um, oftentimes related to the impacts of, of a disaster in a given uh, context. Um, sorry, I'm not very equipped with these slides. Um, so as early as 1999, the IPCC assessment report uh, warned that um, migration would be the largest secondary impact of climate change. So this is not necessarily new information, which is something for us to think about in terms of the, the policy responses that we're seeing to it. Um, but today, the number often taken from the World Bank's Groundswell report is the prediction of 216 million people uh, will be displaced by the impacts of climate change and disasters globally by 2050, uh, with a particular emphasis of vulnerability in the sub-Saharan Africa, Central America, and South Asian regions. However, other estimates suggest that up to 1 billion people could be displaced by 2050. This is coming from Christian Aid, which would be one-tenth of the global population by that time period. Um, so really briefly, I'll try to be quick. I just want to kind of go through some of the challenges that arise with how we actually problematize um, climate-induced displacement, um, as this has decisive kind of consequences for how we actually then respond to it. Um, so first and foremost, there is no internationally agreed upon definition um, of a climate migrant, let alone a climate refugee. And I'm sure Yamna and other colleagues on the panel um, can, can speak to why that is. Um, but it was 1985 uh, was the first time in which um, the term environmental migrant was mentioned, which was mentioned in a UNEP report. And since then, the UNHCR has adopted um, uh, its own definition of an environmental refugee, which is not used for refugee status determination per se, um, but rather has been used by the cluster framework for humanitarian protection and kind of approaching um, this type of protection. The IMO, IOM excuse me, offers um, this definition of an environmental migrant, um, key things to highlight the recognition of environmental degradation as amounting to displacement, not just disasters, um, and that movement can take place within borders and across them. It can take place in a short-term or long-term capacity, um, and that it can both be forced and a matter of choice, all very decisive um, factors for the protection and the prevention aspects. Um, the other piece here I wanted to highlight, this is really just one way of, of framing the kind of categorizations of climate induced displacement, but this is coming from Walter Cullen, um, classifying five categories of um, displacement related to climatic impacts, including um, sudden onset and slow onset disasters, which I'll go into in a second here, um, small island developing states, um, which he categorizes within his own kind of realm, which is quite common because there's a lot of questions around what to do when the entire um, territory of a country may be lost uh, due to rising sea levels. Um, he also mentions uh, environmental degradation as another kind of subcategory, as well as unrest and the serious disturbance of public order, violence and conflict, which might result from the depletion of resources um, that actually can then lead to further displacement. Um, this distinction between slow and rapid onset impacts is uh, kind of no lecture on, on climate migration would be complete without it. 
um, in many regards, I would say that rapid onset impacts are often a little bit more straightforward, um, that the agency that's there to make a decision to move is often limited or stripped in the wake of a, a more of a crisis or emergency uh, type of situation. Um, so these are relatively straightforward when compared with slow onset impacts and what they mean then for um, responding with, with protection solutions. Um, so slow onset impacts um, like drought, for example, um, often kind of blur this distinction between forced and voluntary displacement. Um, and we'll kind of look at why in the next slide as well. Um, the other piece here is this kind of feedback loop in between the two, which I think often goes um, overlooked, which is that slow onset impacts um, may actually turn into a disaster uh, prompted by a rapid onset event, um, or slow onset events may erode communities and ecosystems capacity to withstand the impacts of slow and rapid onset events and can possibly trigger a cascade of, of related hazards. Um, and then also slow onset events are often a hidden aggregating factor um, in many contexts acting as a, as a bit of a threat multiplier um, to pre-existent vulnerabilities um, and to rapid onset disasters. Um, sorry. So then um, it's very difficult to kind of separate climate change impacts from other drivers of displacement, which is why um, oftentimes climate induced displacement is regarded as a bit of a contentious issue. Um, individuals and households tend to make their decisions to move or to stay by assessing their adaptive capacity to withstand threats and by considering the often kind of multiple and compounding threats. So these include social, political, economic, cultural, and environmental factors. Um, and if you look at the second diagram here, which is coming from Richard Black and his colleagues in 2011, um, it centers environmental factors in the middle to kind of emphasize the way in which they exacerbate and amplify pre-existent social, political, economic, demographic vulnerabilities and challenges. Um, another thing we might think about here are um, trapped populations, as Richard Black and his colleagues were assessing, um, those who are unable um, and, and sometimes unwilling to move related to the impacts of climate change and disasters, um, and versus kind of voluntary immobility. Um, so there's a lot of kind of questions here around the, the, um, the agency that is had or stripped by um, individuals and households in their decisions to move or stay, as some of these factors kind of intersect with one another. Um, and amplify the threats related to climate change uh, for displacement and livelihood. Um, most displacement, as I've mentioned, related to the impacts of climate change um, and disasters happens internally. And such movement is very context specific and nearly always depends upon the factors kind of mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, for example, in the wake of um, river flood erosion, um, there was a study in 2012 in, in Bangladesh, um, which was illuminating um, that of the 900 and sorry, the 592 households surveyed um, who had moved in the wake of this river erosion, um, the average distance move was actually one kilometer, with the furthest distance being 10 kilometers, which I think really illuminates that um, oftentimes there are economic factors, for example, um, the, the lack of uh, social networks that might allow for um, a further distance of movement. Um, so we're seeing a lot of kind of permanent and temporary movement in the aftermath of disasters. Um, we're also seeing a lot of rural to urban um, movement for the purposes of employment often. Um, this can be seasonal and it's quite common um, that the male of a household will kind of go and work within a city context and send remittances back to um, a household to be able to stay if this is the kind of sought after uh, condition. Um, so again, each scenario is very different depending on the social, economic, political and cultural factors, as well as I would say the lack or support thereof of um, humanitarian aid agencies, the state, um, you know, kind of what what the perception of the, the uh, assistance of the state might be or might not be in the wake of um, movement or, or staying. Um, and finally, just to kind of conclude here, tying it back to this question of um, how are we responding given these kinds of um, complexities seen in the previous slides. So um, when we think about who are the stakeholders, um, we have quite a long, long list here. There are probably many more actors that could be added, but there's this kind of recurring, really important question here of um, who is implicated and what role should each be playing and how should we be 
acknowledging the roles of each of these sets of actors. Um, so this bigger question as well, which I know Earth Refuge grapples with all the time, of how might we kind of center and amplify the voices and lived experiences of affected and impacted vulnerable communities, those who are at risk and those who have been displaced. Um, I think there are also big questions about what the role of states should be, uh, especially in this kind of so-called post-colonial era, where um, again, we see disproportionate impacts of climate change in contexts where states are often um, kind of fragile or with limited governance or already kind of strained, uh, maybe due to conflict or the lack of resources to be able to respond to internal displacement um, in the first place, in addition to the impacts of climate change um, as standalone factors, but then when these things intersect. Um, of course, Lauren, sorry to interrupt you. I think we're just um, running out of yeah. time. Yeah, Basically. okay. I'll just put it on the last last one here, just essentially to, to set the stage for the um, kind of remaining presentations to think about, um, you know, accountability and responsibility and, and the kind of cross-sectoral approach that is needed to tackling both of these domains, um, that we can think about these from kind of ethical, legal, and, and pragmatic perspectives, um, and this kind of notion of common but differentiated responsibilities. Um, I will leave it there. Uh, I hope that was an, an okay kind of summary of, of the many facets that, that come along with climate migration. Thanks very much, Lauren. That was an excellent introduction to the relationship between uh, climate migration, uh, well, climate change and migration, and also um, taking us into thinking about the legislative uh, context. So I'll now uh, move us on to uh, Yumna Kamel, who will be um, uh, introducing us more to uh, the existing policy framework, thinking about the gaps in that framework, and of course, um, what alternatives we might consider. So Yumna, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you for having me today. And also thank you to Lauren for setting quite a good um, foundation for what I'd like to speak with you all about today. Um, so as was mentioned, I'm the co-founder and executive director of Earth Refuge, which is a legal think tank dedicated to climate migrants. So that means we contextualize the issue uh, much like Lauren just did, but we also try to approach it from um, a legal angle. What rights can we establish um, given the fact that this is a topic that is gargantuan but is not spoken about um, to the same extent as other uh, issues that we face. For instance, the so-called refugee crisis um, in Europe in 2015 and continuing on today, and also um, the North and South American question. Um, 10 minutes is a bit of a squeeze, so I'm going to give a sort of executive summary of each of the things that I'd like to speak about. Um, and do feel free to reach out to me if you have any other questions about these issues um, after the um, panel today, or perhaps the questions can be raised later on. So I'd like to start with um, the question of language, and Lauren touched on this during her presentation. Um, I'm aware that many people in the audience will probably have a legal background and others will not. Um, so the, for the sake of the latter group, um, what caused us to set up Earth Refuge in the first place was the glaring lack of a legal definition for climate migrants or the various groups within um, that ideal. So there's no legal overarching legal definition, but there aren't any sort of smaller catch-all definitions for the sake of protection um, that relate directly to climate or environmental factors. And that is a huge issue given the huge scale of people who are fleeing climate factors globally, um, but also when you contextualize the issue um, in terms of the increasingly isolationist governments we are seeing worldwide uh, and the fact that offering help to outsiders um, is increasingly less attractive. Um, so a brief lesson on legal definitions, you will often hear people referring to climate refugees or, environment, or environmental refugees. And as Lauren mentioned, this is more of sort of a, um, political initiative um, or label, and it's sort of to give people a label to work with when we have these conversations. And having these conversations is extremely important. But legally speaking, and strictly legally speaking, there is no such thing as a climate refugee or an environmental refugee. 
The definition of a refugee was set up in, by the 1951 Refugee Convention, and um, it sort of has bits and pieces and loops and obstacles, which I will not go into today. But what I like to do for the sake of a climate migration nexus um, is refer to what I call a two strike theory. So ultimately, at the core of the definition of a refugee are two things. Firstly, the individual needs to be fleeing persecution in their country of origin on the basis of who they are, um, which is sort of a defined set of characteristics that you can be persecuted um, on the basis of. And the main thing to prove is that the persecution is against you as an individual and no one else. Why is it particular to you? So I'm sure you can see why this is a bit of a challenge when it comes to climate factors, because it's quite difficult to portray climate change as persecution particular to an individual. The second strike is when we talk about um, cross-border initiatives. So the idea of the Refugee Convention is to provide protection to an individual fleeing state A and arriving in state B. Um, Lauren touched on this during her presentation, but largely right now, the majority of people who are fleeing climate factors are fleeing within a border. So they're not crossing a border and seeking protection in another country. There are of course people who are doing that, um, but for the most part, um, people fleeing climate factors are internally displaced peoples. And so for those two reasons, uh, they likely can't fit within the um, Refugee Convention definition. The reason why Earth Refuge, we say climate migrant as opposed to refugee or asylum seeker or any other phrase is because it's sort of a, an all encompassing phrase. Migrant encapsulates refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced people and others. Um, it's not perfect. There are some downfalls to the, to the definition um, and we are completely aware of them. But um, I think the most important thing at Earth Refuge is narrative and ensuring that no one is left out from these conversations. And that's why we've chosen to use climate migrant as our phrase. In terms of the international legal stage, um, there are plenty of challenges, but there are also some um, opportunities that we can cling onto. And so in terms of a whistle stop tour, Lauren also touched on this, there are stakeholders, so um, bodies like the UN, but also national governments and local authorities and institutions. And then there are impacted communities and often there isn't a lot of crossover between the two. Um, so impacted communities are often already vulnerable uh, as a result of systemic discrimination, um, racialized um, complexes and um, the like. And the issue is also that there are no statutes dedicated to climate migration. Um, the issue also with international statutes, and there is talk of you know, an internationally agreed legal definition that's binding on states, but the issue with this is time. Um, climate migration is already happening and it's happening quickly and it's only set to worsen. So the issue when we place solutions entirely in the hands of states and their counterparts is that um, firstly drafting a statute, an international statute is a very time consuming endeavor. Um, encouraging states to agree on one definition, again, takes up time. Encouraging them to then become signatories of this international convention or statute takes even more time. And then implementing that definition or those laws into national infrastructure also takes a heck of a lot of time. Um, and it's quite frankly time that we don't have. Um, and so that's not to say that this wouldn't solve the issue, but also a question that persists when we contemplate this stage, the sort of international stage is, who would be left out of this definition? And people definitely would be, because would the definition encompass cross-border migration or would it encompass um, in-state migration? Um, and what scenarios would it cover? Lauren touched on this also, uh, the fact that the issue of climate migration is multifaceted and different rights come into play, but also different disasters come into play. Um, and in terms of a legal definition on the international stage and the sort of downfalls of it, um, a huge issue is accountability and the lack of binding um, legal responsibilities for the key stakeholders. Um, 
bodies like the UN, you know, create initiatives and um, area arenas for speaking about the issue on a yearly basis, like the COP26 conference or the Stockholm 50. But the key issue with these global platforms is the fact that at the end of these discussions, none of the solutions that are reached or agreed upon or even contentious, um, none of them are binding, none of them are legally binding. And so states do not have a <clears throat> solid responsibility to move forward with um, the solutions that are agreed or discussed or brought to light. Um, there's some hope uh, you know, in terms of this international arena. Um, there's this, uh, there's a now a newly established um, role for a special rapporteur who discusses climate change and human rights um, and has made climate displacement a priority. I think I'm tight for time. So when it comes to discussion, some discussing solutions, I'll just tie that into my questions during the panel. Um, but I think the underlying thought that I'd like to leave you with is the fact that um, often the international stage is not the answer and going local and discussing rights and needs with affected communities could perhaps be a way forward, even if on a smaller scale. So thank you. And um, I'm looking forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Yumna. And as you say, um, you've raised lots of obviously uh, critical questions, which we can pick up again in the panel. So I'd now like to hand over to uh, Dr. Samudu Atapatu, um, who's going to um, focus in her talk on issues regarding colonial legacies, uh, persisting forms of oppression and violence, and uh, the protection of climate refugees within a legal framework of justice and human rights. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Isabel, and thank you for inviting me um, to speak here today. Um, well, the title that was given to me is um, quite a mouthful and encompasses a whole um, course on climate migration, <laughs> let alone a 10 minute presentation. So um, <clears throat> I will, try to touch on the most important things. So let me share my screen. Um, <coughs> okay, uh, right from start. So um, I would like to take a step back and look at the underlying causes of climate change, which is leading to climate migration. Um, because unless we address those underlying causes, we are just putting a band-aid on the issue. Um, we are not really looking at the issue holistically. <coughs> so when you unpack these issues, you can really see that one of the reasons is the astounding inequity in the global community. And I will show you a couple of slides to show that. And the whole economic system um, that has given rise to climate change. Um, so those are the two uh, issues. That obviously, I wouldn't be able to go through all of the slides, uh, but those are the two issues that I want to highlight in my presentation. Um, actually, let me put the time on <laughs> so that I don't go on forever. Um, so, um, and then, of course, uh, the complexity of climate migration, the previous two speakers spoke about the drivers, uh, the various um, uh, reasons uh, why people move and also um, um, the legal gap that we are currently, legal and institutional gap, actually, in relation to climate um, refugees. Um, so, as I said, if you look at um, what's happening, the uh, international um, community, um, we can see that there is such a vast disparity between the rich and the poor. Um, and I came across this um, a headline when I was uh, doing research for another paper and it said, billionaires are the um, leading cause of climate change. Um, and it said that as the world faces environmental disaster on a biblical scale, it is important to remember who exactly brought us here, right? 
um, more than 70% of the global emissions come from just 100 companies. And we know who these companies are, right? And what really astounded me was a more recent um, headline which said that the pandemic is creating a billionaire every 30 hours. So as we speak, we are creating a billionaire. How is that possible? At the same time, a million people fall into extreme poverty at the same rate. So think about this disparity. Um, okay. um, and this is what I want to show when it comes to climate change. This shows that the richest 10% of the world's population is responsible for almost half of total lifestyle consumption emissions. This is from Oxfam, by the way. Reaches 10% is responsible for 50% of emissions, whereas the poorest 50% is responsible only for 10% of uh, consumption emissions. But when it comes to vulnerability to climate change, the situation is completely different. There's a disproportionate impact on those who contribute at least to the problem. So this raises really um, justice issues um, when it comes to climate change, which is driving migration as well, right? Um, you can really see uh, Africa is almost Red. It's red and dark here. Um, India and China, of course, is a big contributor, but um, the um, per capita emissions are still quite low. So what is the role of international law? Um, many international law principles were created when most states were under colonial domination, right? So these states did not have any role in creating many of these um, principles. Uh, and they have struggled, Southern states have struggled over the years uh, to adopt principles that are conducive to them. And they have succeeded um, to some extent. Um, and it's important to realize, as we saw from the previous map, that environmental issues affect communities disproportionately. And the environmental justice movement came about as a result of this, uh, because there is enough evidence to show that hazardous uh, activities, uh, highly polluting activities are located in minority, racial minority communities and poor communities. And this is happening all over the world, not just in the global north. It's happening in the global south as well. Um, and at the same time, we know that climate change also disproportionately affect marginalized groups, including indigenous peoples, women, and we can see the same thing in relation to um, uh, climate migration as well. And we tend to blame the global north for creating climate change, but the southern countries have also been guilty of disregarding rights of the, these groups particularly with programs like the RED program. So uh, the colonial um, uh, origins of international law is well documented um, and colonialism shaped not only doctrines of international law, but its very foundations. Um, and we can see those um, principles still playing out in today's world. Uh, if you look at uh, economic law, uh, international economic law that disproportionately favors the global north while perpetuating the subordination of the global south. So if you look at, uh, for example, bilateral investment treaties, um, which you know, investment is desperately needed in the global south, but these treaties allow multinational companies, which are mostly situated in the global north, to sovereign nations, which are mostly in the global south. Uh, so these are companies suing sovereign nations under these uh, bilateral investment treaties. 
And we also see this northern uh, domination continuing today in the form of climate change uh, is a good example. Um, disposal of hazardous waste, which has been called toxic colonialism. Um, and um, Southern uh, African countries have called climate change as a form of northern aggression on the global south because of this huge uh, disproportionate impact um, on southern states. I will skip this because this has been um, covered. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the environmental justice framework. Um, so as I mentioned, many polluting activities affect poor and marginalized communities disproportionately um, in both rich and poor countries. This led to the environmental justice movement and there are numerous examples um, in the US as well as uh, in other countries, um, Hurricane Katrina, Kivalina, Shishmarov, uh, these are communities in Alaska that have to be relocated because of climate change. They are awaiting um, relocation. Um, some communities um, in Louisiana are um, already been relocated, but one of the questions that um, these communities are asking is who is going to pay for the relocation? And the richest country in the world cannot um, relocate communities um, that are being affected by climate change. Um, and as a result, um, they are living in appalling conditions uh, and nobody is putting in money to improve their living standards because they are going to be relocated anyway. Um, there are other examples from all over the world, La Oroya in Peru, Ogoni people in Nigeria, um, indigenous communities in Ecuador, uh, Bhopal in India, so the list continues. Um, so if you look at um, the environmental justice framework, um, there are many components and many definitions, but uh, basically we can identify at least four um, components. Distributive justice uh, component requires the equal treatment of people, equal access to resources and amenities, and not just distributing pollution um, on them. Um, but differential treatment might be needed, like affirmative action to address uh, past injustices. Uh, procedural justice requires um, access to timely information, an opportunity to participate in the decision-making process and access to justice. And it, when it comes to um, indigenous peoples, um, it requires the free prior and informed consent of these communities, especially if they are to be re relocated from their um, traditional lands. Corrective justices, uh, justice requires punishing wrongdoers, redressing past wrongs, and discontinuing wrongful acts and compensating victims. And this is where we see time and time again that um, wrongdoers are not punished, especially if they are multinational corporations that are responsible um, for the damage inflicted on these communities. Um, no compensation is provided to the victims. Um, um, Chevron in Ecuador is a good example. People have been suffering and um, have not even um, received any compensation. Um, although the country had to pay millions of dollars under the bilateral investment treaty to um, the company in question. And the final uh, component is social justice. Um, environmental justice struggles cannot be separated from other forms of um, justice, struggles for other forms of justice. So it, it's very um, um, linked to issues like colonialism, racism, marginalization, um, uh, so the, all these problems have to be addressed together. So um, I will skip most of these. And um, so when we talk about climate displacement, it's very important to look at this through a justice framework, look at who caused the problem, look at who is being compelled to move. Um, small island states is a good example where 
entire countries might have to be relocated. Um, and there are various approaches to climate refugees. I don't have time to go through this. Maybe we can discuss this um, in the Q&A. And I want to um, leave you with this um, quote from Oxfam again. Climate change is inextricably linked to economic inequality. It is a crisis that's driven by greenhouse gas emissions of the haves that hits the have-nots the hardest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Adipatu. That was a, um, a very um, thought-provoking um, presentation that you gave. And of course, um, the issues it raises will now turn to discuss in greater depth. Uh, amongst our, our panelists. So um, we now have 30 minutes for uh, a panel discussion. And those of you in the audience, if you would like to put forward any questions that you have for um, particular uh, speakers, uh, or those of us, those who are participating in the panel, please feel free to do so in the Q&A. So we will uh, start with a dialogue amongst our panelists, um, but then uh, bring into that discussion questions that uh, other participants um, may like to pose. So I'd just like to kick off um, in, in terms of thinking about the focus of our panel, which is very much about um, what can be done. So what might be the uh, solutions uh, legislative and, and otherwise to address uh, climate migration. Um, if, if Professor um, uh, Tasneem Siddiqui, if you would be willing to kick off with your reflections, um, that would be fantastic. Muted. Sorry, if you wouldn't mind just unmuting yourself. Sorry Fantastic. About this. Sorry about this. Thank you. Okay. Yes, it was fascinating listening to all these uh, participants. And uh, at this stage, we can concentrate on what to do when, you know, climate change and displacement, it is inevitable, inevitable figures are coming. So what to do? I think I'll concentrate on that. And while doing so, you know, these are the basic data that we always hear that, you know, the way people are being displaced and climate change is induced population shifts will take place on top of pre-existing complex uh, mobility patterns. So it is on top of what has been happening before. However, I think we have heard in many occasions that it is a huge challenge, but it is possible to minimize the loss and damages of displacement. It is not impossible, like Sendai framework, Cancun adaptation framework, Gramswell report, all asserts that up to 80% of the displacement can be reduced. But then again, not all types of migration can be prevented. We can't think that we can prevent everything, but then, it is possible to prevent. I'll just take you to local scenario and uh, I will talk about uh, how in the context of Bangladesh, policymakers, civil society, they are trying to resolve uh, to some extent nationally, whatever can be done to help or to establish the rights of the climate and disaster induced displaced persons. So if you think landslide, you can see that you know in hill areas that's the problem, and then riverbank erosion in Noria, 
so that villages after villages are completely immersed to a uh, river. And then you think this is a health, health crisis. Another thing, if it health, uh, you know, uh, support providing in, uh, structure, it is underwater. And in a, when they are displaced, these communities are living in places. This is their toilet. And this is their, uh, places where they are cooking. And interestingly, all these pictures are taken by the displaced people, what I'm showing you today. And the research from which we got this, we call it photo voice research. So it is the displaced population who were given cameras and they were asked, what do they see as problem? So that's how they try to problematize what they are facing in the once they are displaced. In the urban, in the rural location, you have seen in urban locations, this is how even the water, it is a government water, but they have to buy that water from locally influentials. And that's how they live. And this picture taken by a woman stating that they're bed is under like over just over water in their room or it is inundated and six of them sleeping you know when water is down there and the other great story that I would like to just mention in a minute that uh in a during a flash flood when people were a family was leaving on top of a roof it is uh, in the morning the mother finds that the baby has fallen, she's no longer there. She, she was washed away by flood when she, while she was sleeping. When children were asked that what is their problem, water logging they identified in their urban where they have moved in and then eviction, continuous eviction is and making new uh, sort of uh, living. That is another problem. And also in the urban locations, problems, challenges actually differ on the basis of gender, then age, then ethnicity, type of work you are you know, involved in, like for students, space, uh, young children, they identify that they don't have any place to uh, you know, stay. And a little boy, you can say going to school in an inundated area. So these are the displacement challenges that the, these migrants are facing continuously. And if we just from there come to legal and policy arena, you can see we have studied all these policies, urbanization policy, national housing policy, national uh, sort of uh, uh, urban and regional planning, climate change adaptation policies, national adaptation action plan, Bangladesh climate change strategy, you can see none of them, only like it's invisible. This whole issue of displacement is invisible. And in others, it is seen as a problem. The victims are seen as a problem. And they, in the mindset of the urban or the policymaker, is that they need to go back to their places of origin. Doesn't matter how hard it is. It's a, like a dream that they all want to stay back in their places of origin. And only two documents actually discusses displacement. So given this scenario, if there is like some solutions are emerging at a national level. So I will uh, take you there. In 2021, Bangladesh, the government of Bangladesh has adopted a national strategy on internal displacement management. And interestingly, this document upholds internally displaced person shall enjoy in full equity, the same rights and freedom under the international and domestic laws as do other persons of the country. I think this is a big uh, sort of uh, achievement on the part of civil society, I would say, to push government to come up with such a right-based document uh, on, on uh, you know, how to, how to assert the rights of climate-induced migrant. 
And this whole document, it is based on international standards and spirit of climate justice and that UN guiding principles of international displacement, the Sendai framework, the Nansen principle, the SDG goals, these are the basis of this document and it concentrate on three areas, prevention of displacement, protection during displacement and durable solutions. Now, main highlights of the document, like it is inclusive, of all sections of the society, ethnicity, religion, gender, age, disability, geographic location, all. And then uh, it plans for creating infrastructure, maintaining vital ecosystem, reducing displacement and out migration. Uh, it outlines adaptation programs to accommodate new migrants in urban and rural out migration locations. So far, and this is completely a new thing because now it is involving private sector for asking for creating job in the urban location and semi-urban urban location and asking for decentralization. Then plans for sustainable cities inclusive of new migrants. It encourages involvement of private sector. And then, as I have said, as I have said, that protection during durable solution, these like every, uh, there are 40 uh, uh, sort of uh, articles, then uh, 31 and 28 that specifically comes with what needs to be done. Now, this policy can remain as a policy unless you prepare an action plan and try to implement it. So the government, particularly the ministry in charge, uh, Ministry of Disaster and Relief has now drafted a sort of action plan that will last from 2022 to 2042. And in this action plan, 27 ministries are involved and you know, international through international advisory body, through uh, UNDDWG network participation, uh, UNDDR, uh, UNDRR's participation, the global knowledge has been uh, taken into this document. So this is, you know, uh, we consider that this particular document would require, of course, international support, national support, and other, other things. And there are lot to be learned, lot to learn, from uh, this experience at a uh, you know uh, local level at a national level and uh, I, I, I would say that again to implement that policy the global community also has to come up with from a right-based approach their contribution and then that's where this whole debate of spending 50 percent into adaptation then previous thing of 70% into adaptation. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Siddiqui. I'm now going to um, ask uh, Atle Solberg to um, give his reflections. And then um, it would be great if our uh, other panelists might like to come back in and, and perhaps reflect on some of the points that you've, um, you've raised. So Atle, would you like to... Uh, Yes, yes, please. And uh, Thank you. Uh, confirming that you can uh, can hear me. Okay, I, I just see there are some construction works taking place outside my office now. So let's hope they will not drill. But I, I just wanted to, to, to thank all the previous speakers. I think this is great. And I think this is all very comprehensive and um, and, and, and thank you so much. Uh, so it's very hard to, to add anything or, or, or pinpoint, but uh, maybe uh, let me try something. Um, I think, I think both Yumna and, and Lauren, uh, you, you made a very strong case that this is complex. This is a dense field. There is definition, there is conceptual disagreement. So, so to pinpoint uh, what we are talking about and, and to, to identify what would be the appropriate policy in a given circumstances would be difficult. And I think that's an important uh, message. This is not an area that lends itself easily to identification of what we 
we, we, we talk about. I think even if you are honest, we are combining one concept, climate, which is in itself ambiguous, and then migration, which is also ambiguous because we don't really agree what we mean and we combine them and then we, we have um, have a complexity complexity there and um, but what we um, uh, we can try to, to unpack uh, a little you know there are certain things we know and and, and that climate change will be important uh, aspect of uh, the reason or the motivation for people moving uh, we can think about some very natural hazards or climate risk very close to climate change. Uh, think about sea level rise, you know, that will affect communities, at least in coastal areas, and many will have to move. And we can quite clearly say that this is a movement triggered clearly in the context of the adverse effect of climate change. Uh, drought uh, caused by climate change is also probably an area that will um, will also generate mobility, but maybe a different type of mobility than sea level rise, which is more slow uh, and uh, you can think that drought is something that is is more temporary although we have seen drought over over several years and and another aspect close to climate change i think is heat waves uh, you know the, the the rising temperature that will put people at risk so these are some some aspects um, uh, to have in mind and there will be different forms of mobility and different forms of need uh, sea level rise may put even the territorial existence of certain um, uh, places at risk, uh, given uh, some of the hazards. And I think it's also important um, that we, we highlight the other hazards that are out there that might not be directly linked to, to climate change. Uh, storm, uh, hurricanes, and other events that may be more related to natural variability. And I also like the fact that we, have attention on geophysical hazards, uh, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanoes that also put people at risk um, of, of moving. So what does that lead us or, or leave us, maybe you say um, in English, uh, clearly this is so complex and that suggests that we may need to um, have a very flexible approach to solutions. You know, what are exactly the solution for people that are affected by these different climate risks and and, and has said, and I wanted to, while I heard the other speakers, I wanted to just show one slide that I, I've used previously. And uh, maybe if um, Isabel, you can confirm that you can see this slide. Uh, yes. And, and, and maybe this is um, speaking a little to, um, to, um, to Yumna and, um, and, and Laurent in terms of, it's clearly a legal gap. We do lack international status and we really need uh, more uh, global standards. But given that this is a very complex phenomenon, if you agree on that, we also need to, to look at other policy options. And I think Tasneem also in a very good way explained how the national strategy in Bangladesh very much draw on what is, uh, sorry, what is already existing international agreement and very quickly and i think that is important that while we wait for that um first of all maybe we do not uh find a solution from a protection per perspective to a global standard that shall cover all the situation maybe that's not what we want to look for maybe that is not the solution to all these different situations we're talking about and that means we we may want to look across the policy and action areas. And there is quite a lot we have we can work on uh, in terms of what states have committed uh, throughout the last 10 years. And uh, very quickly, the Nansen Initiative Protection Agenda is a document endorsed by 110 states, which spells out what are some of the effective practices that can be used to avert and minimize displacement in terms of risk mitigation, risk reduction, and what do you do or can do when people across are, are displaced across border. We have from 2018, two global compacts, one on migration and one on, on, on refugees. And particularly the global compact for migration has police, political commitment from states to reduce drivers, but also to create and promote the use of pathways when people are displaced um, across border. Uh, different pathways that can draw on existing national migration 
policies, existing human rights obligation, existing uh, tools for uh, refugee protection in certain, certain circumstances. We have the sender framework. Uh, Tasnim has already convincingly said how the sender framework can also be used. Uh, it refers specifically to displacement and how to prepare for it and how to respond to it. We um, cannot really go into in this meeting, but under the climate change convention, and I think uh, we have already heard all the way since that Cancun adaptation framework in 2010, there are decisions made by parties to the convention in, uh, in aspects related to migration, displacement and, and planned relocation. So there are commitment we can use to, uh, to, um, to, to build up a, a better policy response. And the decision, under the climate convention are also also binding. So it's not that there is a legal vacuum around some of these uh, decisions. And finally, uh, not forget uh, the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda that has policy options. And finally, human rights are also an important tool when we try to find policy areas. So this is more a global snapshot of what we can work on in the absence of uh, agreement at the international level on, a, on, on, on an international statute. And that is important. Uh, what we work on uh, under the platform on disaster displacement, which is a follow-up to the Nansen initi initiative, is to promote some of those practices that states are already using to either avert displacement, uh, minimize displacement, or address displacement, including across border. So there's quite a lot we can actually use when we remind states of their obligation and their policy commitment and their existing policy framework. So uh, half full the glass in terms of opportunities to drive the policy agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much, Batle. Um, I'd like to hand over now to uh, Yumna and Sumudu, if you'd like to, uh, perhaps Yumna first, give your reflections on some of the issues that uh, Tasneem and Adle have raised, and of course, wider points that have been um, raised by um, yourselves and other speakers. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, Adela and Justine both provided um, a fantastic segue into uh, my favorite topic surrounding climate migration, which is um, zooming into uh, localized solutions that already exist. Um, so, um, at Earth Refuge, we take a legal approach to climate migration, but as opposed to campaigning for this wider overarching definition, um, and as opposed to sort of stepping into a sphere and saying, you know, we have legal expertise, whatever that is, um, and imposing a solution upon a community, we find that consultation with that community and amplifying their narrative should be the core first step to approaching legal solutions. Um, and by that, I mean, uh, for those of you who don't have a legal background, um, where an individual or a body or a community has a right to something, another body elsewhere um, will have a duty to fulfill or uphold that right and to ensure that it comes to fruition. So, you know, if we, if, if we take an example, for instance, um, the right to sanitation and a healthy environment will typically be a duty imposed upon a local or a national authority to ensure that there is appropriate infrastructure to uphold that right. Is there the infrastructure to support sanitation? Does it reach enough communities? So on and so forth. Obviously the extent to which that duty is carried out is um, de depends on where you are um, and the situation. So with that in mind, with this idea of consultation with communities and rights that somehow relate to climate migration, either the drivers or in the aftermath of an event, um, the rights that need to be tapped into, those are what we're trying to work with. Um, and um, in terms of how this can actually happen and how we try to carry it out and, and don't just treat it like sort of a theoretical, idea that we discuss in you know specialist circles is we go out or as, as as far as the pandemic allows us we go out and speak to communities so we're starting with india um and specifically with the state of rajasthan 
and we uh, discuss the realities of climate displacement, either as it has already happened or imminently will happen. And we ask, you know, who is being most affected? Is it, you know, female farmers? And how are they being affected? Is it that their crops are uprooted or are their homes being destroyed? If it's a matter of crops, can sustainable agriculture and the right to education as it relates to agriculture come into this discussion? Um, because that is one of the sustainable development goals. Can that be a right that is um, um, embellished for that community and upheld by the local authority? Is it a matter of um, you know, discussing other methods and teaching other methods of farming so that if the pH of the soil changes as a result of slow onset climate factors, there are other adaptive ways to farm and maintain a livelihood and remain in the same place. Um, if it's a rapid onset event, if it's you know a hurricane that leaves an area destroyed, um, are there cities nearby that should take on a certain responsibility? Should there be a duty upon nearby cities to incorporate disaster relief or the welcoming of migrants into their cities? And for more information on that, I'd suggest that um, our audience members take a look at the Mayor's Migration Council and the initiatives that are being pursued there because um, for the first time in history, the majority of humans are living in cities now. And so that means that um, a huge amount of responsibility falls upon cities to mitigate and respond to climate change and the sort of movement um, that is happening as a result of it. So cities are crucial and the rights and duties there are also crucial. And then the last thing I'll sort of touch on before um, handing over to Samudu is that um, one crucial um, thing that has been touched upon during the course of the presentations today is the rights of indigenous peoples when it comes to climate migration, but also climate change more generally. Um, Globally speaking, indigenous peoples remain uh, custodians of the land, regardless of the persecution that they have faced at the hands of various um, um, bodies, governments, colonies. Um, and much wisdom is held by those communities as to how we can mitigate the climate crisis, but also respond to it and how we can connect with the land. Um, and also serious rights that come into consideration when we look at indigenous communities are the rights to culture, so the right to both receive and transmit culture and to ensure that languages are not lost along the way. And, um, you know, when a community is so closely tied to the land, when the language is tied to the land and the livelihood is tied to the land, when that land is eroded, what happens to that community? Where do they go? And how can we preserve that community and all the wisdom that that encompasses? Um, so those are rights that are being currently looked at by the International Court of Justice and by various bodies, um, and also by us at Earth Refuge. So those are some considerations and some alternative routes for thinking and coming up with um, solutions that are perhaps more local, maybe not as globally sweeping, but I'm a firm believer that if a right is um, codified or at least acknowledged on a smaller scale, then it sets a precedent for other areas in the world to look at and say, okay, well, this right was established in New Zealand for this indigenous community, why can't we transpose it to another area in the world? And, you know, um, zoom it out and make it larger. So those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yumla. Uh, Samudu, uh, it would be great if you could offer your reflections and in particular, um, your talk obviously raised critical issues in thinking about climate migration through the lens of a um, justice and human rights based framework. And I was wondering um, what, uh, given those vast global inequities that you pointed to, what do you think that means in terms of um, our discussion here about what we can what we can do, what that might look like? Um, sure. Um, so um, two points and I mean they fall largely within the um, the rights and justice framework that I um, talked about earlier. Um, so recognition, first of all, I think the recognition that this is happening, it is a problem, is important. And we took far too long to recognize that, that climate migration is a problem, it's an issue. Um, and that means when you don't really recognize the problem, and as Lauren pointed out, the IPCC said in their very first report in 1990 that the greatest single impact of climate change could be on human migration. 
it took the international community 25 years, 25 years to even conceptualize it and establish a task force on climate migration, right? Even now, I mean, the task force has met and come up with some recommendations, but nothing really concrete, right? So I think problematizing is the first step, I think, and it's happening. It's happening in scholarly circles, in NGOs, in think tanks, it's happening, but we need that at the uh, top level, states needs to get together and address that issue. And secondly, and a lot, a lot of you pointed to the fact that much of the displacement will be internal. Um, but we know that many of the countries that will face this problem, that are facing this problem, don't, do not have the resources to address this issue. So they do need the help of the international community, particularly those who contributed to the problem. So how do we get the industrialized countries to contribute to this problem, to help those who are going to face this problem in the future, uh, help the developing countries who are faced with a climate migration problem to address the issue. And uh, to get, I mean, uh, the connected to that is the loss and damage mechanism. We have included that in the Paris Agreement, but again, uh, in uh, 2015, again, it was very controversial to include that in the uh, Paris Agreement, uh, but it was only last year that Scotland led some money to the loss and damage mechanism. Um, and we really need that funding to come. Uh, and if that doesn't happen, then you know many of the things that we are talking about, the rights and justice framework, will be really hard to implement uh, if that assistance is not forthcoming to these countries that really need it. Um, so I'll stop there with those two thoughts. Thank you very much, um, Samudu. I'm aware that we've got um, quite a few very interesting questions coming through in our Q&A. Um, and so I'd like to give other participants the opportunity to um, now uh, pose questions, additional questions to our wonderful speakers and panelists. And I'm going to hand over to uh, Michaela, who will um, now um, bring up some of those questions that we've already got uh, coming through uh, for you to uh, address. So Michaela, if you'd like to. Yeah, um, just scrolling through the questions, there are a lot, um, I think. Maybe um, amongst really there there are themes amongst these questions, and um, one of them kind of talks about from legal and policy making perspectives how to recognize um, how to protect climate migrants and their rights. Um, Simon Anderson from IAED asks. Um, it's unlikely that the legal rights of displaced people pitched into climate vulnerability will be respected by authorities responsible for dis displacement. So who will uphold the rights of the displaced? And in a similar manner, Perry, um, based in uh, Tunis from the North African Policy Initiative, asks for examples of climate displacement tied to specific state actions. So. I'd like to kind of toss this question to probably Yamna from the legal perspective and uh, uh, Tasneem uh, with regards to your work uh, with the um, National Strategy on Climate Dis Displacement in Bangladesh. So maybe Yamna can go first, yeah. Okay, so, um, so in terms of, um, examples of climate displacement tied to specific state actions. Um, I have one that's a little bit niche, um, but uh, at Earth Refuge, we were working on a case on conducting the legal research for a case um, concerning a Guatemalan individual, an indigenous indiv individual, um, and the larger rights of that community. They're the Mayan Achi. 
Um, and, and there is concrete evidence to show that um, certain environmental policies and decisions that were made by the government throughout the Civil War, which spanned about 20 years, um, directly impacted and were intended to impact the Mayan Aji and to strip them of their um, connection to the land by uh, destroying the land. So, for instance, by um, building a dam, which caused um, um, flooding and then drought. Um, so the land became sort of un farmable, um, but also by causing the forced internal migration. So picking up a community and moving it further away um, from that area um, so that it would become a fragmented community, but also that their language would be lost um, and other sort of cultural indicators. So yes, there are quite a few. Um, if, you, if you look up the Chicoy Dam, so C-H-I-X-O-Y um, in Guatemala, there's some examples there. Um, and in terms of how to uphold the rights of the displaced, well, obviously it falls on um, uh, individuals like ourselves to sort of concretize what those rights are, but in terms of how to actually force um, authorities to uphold those rights, that's where the legal accountability comes in. So if we zoom in and we say, okay, there's a right to um, you know, infrastructure or there's a right to education, or there was a right to a healthy environment and we hold um, a government accountable to that and, and a court stipulates that a government or a local authority is accountable, then they will by law have to observe that condition or else face penalties. Um, how difficult it is to actually um, uh, enforce that accountability is obviously, it's, it's difficult. Um, and there have been like some moments of hope. So the Sharma case in Australia went some way to establishing um, a duty against the uh, Australian Minister of Environment to protect younger generations from the impact of, of climate change. Um, and it was a landmark decision, but then um, it was just reversed by a federal court. Um, so every time we take 10 steps, uh, two steps forward, we sort of take 10 steps back. So it will be a battle, but um, eventually it will have to happen because the issue is just so pressing. So I hope that that answers those questions to an extent. Okay. Uh, yes, I would. I would say that you know, uh, it is always state. If you think, uh, you know, at a state level, if we want to, you know, action we want to take, state will never be the main, uh, you, you know, proactive organization. It is the civil society bodies. They are the one who articulates the demand. And that demand is then placed before the government. And, you know, as there is a very good communication with the environment and, uh, you know, disaster and other ministries with civil society, because civil society, when they go into international forum, you will see that it is the government and the national civil societies and national governments, they sit together, work together against the international sort of legal regime or international bodies so that they argue together. So that creates certain uh, synergy between these two groups. And that I would say is important if we want to bring in state action. That's how our experience of uh, creating this national strategy happened. It is in 2015, we started as a civil society initiative, but then again, over the years, government uh, I once took it, then throw it, then it took five years to convince government to come up with this strategy. So once you could convince them and once you have right kind of, uh, you know, secretary and other, government service uh, holders, then it becomes easy. And uh, again, uh, you know, the type of rights that are constitutionally in your country, whatever is espoused, if you think the way this national strategy is framed, like it, when it is prevention to displacement, examples of relevant rights, non-discrimination and equality, right to safety, right to life, right to development, right to shelter, right to work, right to participation, right to information. So this is said at the beginning. And now when it is a government document, 
when it's a government document, now civil society can ask government as well as those who the development partners in Bangladesh who are working on climate change and uh, to and then again mindset is always uh, local level adaptation and uh, not thinking about urban solutions so you can then convince them that this is the document that says this and which are the aspects you would like to implement so you come up with your instead of just haphazardly doing same thing in three places you donor community you divide and wherever you want to support, you support, but on the basis of these rights. So I would say it's a very much an activism. And of course, it is a very complex process. It is not easy. I would say that particularly if we think about, uh, you know, think about this whole thing, this whole uh, displacement issue is placed under uh, loss and damage. So when you think, uh, you know, in case of displacement, the type of actions that are required. Ah, so under loss and damage, sometimes it may get, uh, you know, um, dissolved in other way because from identification, how do you go about in the loss and damage framework, how do you go about the type of actions required to be taken? So it becomes problematic that problem needs to be solved. That, you know, and that is the process I understand through legal analysis and uh, through uh, more reflection, you develop ways under which the loss and damage framework can provide support to the displaced people. At this point, there is a disjuncture. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, really insightful responses to a really complex um, problem. Um, I'd like to, Sumudu, uh, because you have to leave soon, um, I'd like to kind of stay on the topic of kind of accountability and legal accountability and ask you a question um, from Jeremiah, um, who is from the University of Colorado's Boulder Department of Environmental Study. And he asks Dr. Atapatu, in thinking about accountability from a legal standpoint and establishing rights, as some of the speakers mentioned today, and using the terminology from economics, how can we disentangle and distribute accountability for emissions and climate change between companies and billionaires that own them, demand from individuals for products and things that we need to survive? Yeah, it's a, it's a million dollar question, right? <laughs> how do we um establish accountability so uh there are different levels of accountability and uh, different levels you can establish accountability uh maybe at the state level at the federal level at the international level um so at the international level uh, accountability is mainly about states um but at the um state level at the national level you might be able to establish accountability of these um, companies. And um, one of the biggest challenges has been causation, establishing causation, but attribution science has developed quite a bit now. And we know that the World Resources Institute has um, all this information about all the companies that are contributing, it's about 150 companies and we know who they are. Um, so without those companies, um, climate change would not have happened. Um, so we need to come up with the problem has been that our legal tools have not developed enough. They have lagged behind, I should say both at the national level and at the international level. At the international level, we don't have collective theories of liability. Um, at the national level, our principles have developed much more than international law. Um, all it would take is a good test case. And I put that uh, challenge out to the lawyers in the room, bring a good test case. Um, in the US, I mean, we are, I think, going uh, in the wrong direction when it comes to legal challenges. We have, you know, gone behind by 50 years in some cases. 
and there is an interesting case pending before the uh, Supreme, sorry, Supreme Court right now about the Environmental Protection Agency's authority to um, regulate um, greenhouse gas emissions. So a lot of people are thinking that it will go the same way as the abortion case, um, which is unfortunate. Uh, but other countries are coming forward. There are lots of good cases that have come up. I think we need to challenge at every level. Um, whoever we can um, uh, hold accountable, whether it's at the local authority level, at the state level, individual level, corporate level, uh, I think we should do it. I think that is the only way. All we need is a huge fine on some of these companies. Just one would be enough to make them realize that they cannot continue uh, with business as usual. I know I don't have an exact answer to the question, um, but as lawyers, we have always sort of pushed the envelope. We have tested the grounds. Um, and many of the principles have developed because we were willing to challenge the existing laws. So I think we need to keep on doing it. Just look at the tobacco cases, right? When tobacco cases started, Nobody thought that, you know, there will be uh, um, such huge awards against tobacco companies, right? Um, we should do the same with fossil fuel companies uh, because there is enough evidence to show that they suppress the science. They knew that, you know, fossil fuels were causing climate change and they suppress that science the same way that the tobacco companies suppress science relating to addiction of nicotine. So I think as lawyers, let's go all out there and use all the tools we have and try and get one big um, case, one big decision against these companies. Thank you. And sorry, I need to go. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Atapatu, and um, for your presentation today um, and your answer. Um, I'll, I'll let you leave, um, but I actually wanted to stay on the topic of also um, sort of the need for multi-stakeholder engagement. And I think um, this is where Atle, you might come in, is because of your work with the platform of disaster displacement. Um, and uh, it kind of relates to the question posed by Celeste Abrams, who um, asks, climate and migration did not feature prominently at COP26 and no commitments were made, but it featured heavily at the International Migration Review Forum this May in New York. It seems that the conversations happening in the migration policy sphere and climate policy sphere are disconnected. How might we join up these discussions to get better international cooperation and buy-in? I'll open it up to Atle first, and whoever also wants to respond to this question on panel, I see test Dr. Siddiqui um, nodding her head. Um, please feel free to join in. I, I think, um, uh, Celeste, I think that that's a great, uh, great, um, great question. And, and I think it, it's in line with what I tried to say earlier, that we need to work within different frameworks because there will be different solutions. And then I would... But I would start to maybe contest that. Uh, I think, what do they do in the conference of the parties? They primarily try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And in that sense, if there's any single thing we can do to reduce the risk of being displaced at the current juncture is that we really combat climate change. So in that sense, we shouldn't underestimate those efforts. I'm the first to say that we are not meeting the temperature goals, and we are way behind, but at least there are attempts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, or what we call mitigate the adverse effect of climate change. So, so there are our efforts. There were also some progress, 
under the um, uh, under the conference of the parties in terms of reaching the adaptation goals. So uh, again, there will be increasingly need for adaptation resources so people can adapt to the adverse effect of climate change. I, I mentioned at the outset, what about sea level, right? To a certain level, you can actually adapt to that by, by building um, higher walls. Maybe not uh, in ad infinitum, but at least there are options to adapt even in the context of, um, of a changing uh, climate. I very much agree with the, with the previous speaker that um, on loss and damage, there is still a lot of work to be done. But if you have a slightly longer time horizon and we look at 2013, where the Warsaw of International Mechanism on Loss and Damage was established, and we walk through 2015 when there was a decision on a task force on displacement. In 2019, or tw yes, in 2019 in Madrid, we established the Santiago Network uh, on loss and damage. And in the conference of the parties, um, uh, the, 20, uh, the, the one in, um, in Glasgow, there was also a decision on a Glasgow dialogue on findings for loss and damage. So there are maybe incremental and not sufficient some progress around loss and damage. And I wouldn't say that um, the issue of human mobility is absent uh, because it is there. And also we have to remember the objective of the framework Convention on climate change, it is to stabilize greenhouse gas emissions. So the primary objective is um, uh, around that, not necessarily uh, human mobility. Unfortunately, because we are not able to combat climate change, we see then the effects on the risk of displacement. And that's why there is increasingly work uh, around human mobility under the convention. Um, and then it is a little contraintuitive that if climate change shall be dealt with under the framework convention on climate change, why do they talk so much about it at the IMRF in the International Migration Review Forum that um, met in, in May this year? And um, I would all, almost also maybe put that back to Celeste that what we have found is that although um, uh, the, the, the issue of climate change figured very prominently during the international migration review process, a baseline mapping we did on progress on the Global Compact for Migration is that we have seen far more advances in terms of climate change adaptation policies, disaster risk uh, reduction policies, including the challenge of human mobility. So that is where the policy development is actually happening if you look at countries, look at Bangladesh and and I just came back from Fiji last week, I'm happy to talk a little about the progress they have done there. But uh, disappointingly, when we look at policy development regarding migration governance, we are lagging behind. So although maybe at the rhetorical level, climate change figure very prominently in the International Migration uh, Review Forum, we, when we do look at migration policies and migration legislation and other tools to to govern mobility across border, there is less development than you see in that other side of the equation, which is how uh, human mobility included into disaster risk reduction and, and climate change adaptation. We did a baseline mapping on this, and I'm happy to paste that into the chat box so you can see some of the findings. But that means we need to continue bringing in uh, this discussion when we go to the conference of the parties, continue to, to advocate for the inclusion of stronger mitigation, stronger adaptation, and stronger loss and damage uh, work. Uh, but also when we are dealing with the more migration-related conversation at global level, bring in the climate change and the risk uh, aspects. So we need to have that dual uh, approach to it. And this is also, even before we try to use, for example, the the, the, the human rights framework as tools for better protection. And somebody mentioned already the special rapporteur on, on human rights and cl climate change. And maybe that's another opportunity coming forward now that we can work on. So a uh, great question, Celeste. I hope I was able to answer it, but uh, it was an attempt at least to answer that. Mm. I think I think it's a brilliant answer. Your answer is very good. I, I would add a little bit here is that what I feel like I come from migration background. So my research is began migration research. And from migration, in fact, it's uh, Richard Black who actually pushed me to come into 
climate change, migration, adaptation. Uh, so that way. But what I feel, wherever I go, there is a disjunct between climate change researcher and migration researchers. There, there is a gap of knowledge. No? So why I am saying this, like those who are in the climate change and particularly into right-based advocacy kind of research, they securitized the migration. They tried to sell it as if, if the global community does not take proper action, all these migrants will start walking to your territory. So that's where this whole fear uh, created a fear of migration. That migration, like you are not doing anything. So this is, this is what you are going to face. So that way, unethically, what these researchers did is uh, put the victims as a threat. So instead of supporting them, actually they put them as a threat, which is, I feel very unethical. Why I feel unethical? Because I come from migration background. In migration background, I talk about the rights of the migrants, which is displaced or, uh, you know, just labor migrant, voluntary migrant, forced refugees. It is about the right of these all group of workers. So these two, one is kind of stopping, working for stopping migration. So that is why this whole discourse would run from a threat perspective. And in the migration thing, there is this right aspect, but what is missing is that knowledge of how to accommodate climate migration into overall discussion of, uh, you know, their migration governance. And again, uh, Atli, you may have, you know, uh, described the compact in a, you know, it, it, as a very, uh, I would say, nice document. But what I feel that, you know, uh, it is non-binding, that is a separate thing. But even then, when real issues emerge, compact is not capable to handle. And this midterm, the, the whole review that took place in, uh, you know, in where, in New York, uh, the whole, like those of us from our organizations who participated, it was so much planned that who will talk, who cannot talk, and what should be discussed. It is all done from quite some time ago. And so very sanitized kind of discussion. That's why I would say uh, Compact failed to bring in the real issues, although very good work has been done by UN and its you know, functionaries and researchers, but not the activism uh, could you know, find its place there. So that is, I think that is where we have to work both in climate change uh, sort of all the international forums as well as migration development forums and try to juxtapose both everywhere. Maybe it makes sense or not. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it does make sense. Um, and uh, I think, you know, speaking about activism and really trying to amplify the voices in the space, um, it goes back to kind of what Earth Refuge is trying to do. Um, so I think going back to the legal aspects and how advocacy can be a tool to amplify voices, I'd like to ask um, perhaps Lauren first and then Yamna, um, a question posed by Roshan, um, who asks, to what extent can strategic litigation be leveraged to provide durable solutions for climate migrants? Yeah, it's a great question. I feel like Yamra can definitely complement uh, my kind of intro comments on it. Um, I think in general, strategic litigation is a very important avenue for addressing systemic issues that are um, in many ways being um, overlooked, um, that are obviously implicating uh, entire groups or communities of people, um, but kind of 
you know, bringing together, for those who aren't familiar, bringing together um, those who would have direct victim status before a court um, and kind of assembling their, their cases to, to then kind of forum shop for the, the right court or space to, to bring the argument there. Um, I think it allows, it, it's a strong angle for allowing um, an addressal of, again, a more kind of broader set of systemic issues. So how this might look in a climate migration context is that we know that a given community is vulnerable. We know that they're experiencing whichever impacts they're experiencing. We know that this, for example, might be amplifying their um, vulnerability with respect to food insecurity, um, threats to their rights, to their livelihoods, to their survival and continuity for indigenous groups in particular. Um, so then it would be kind of bringing those who have direct victim status before a court, um, before, before a court, but collectively to represent kind of the overarching issues within a given community context. And I think this is quite a potentially strong way to, um, address some of those kinds of compounding challenges. Um, but also as, as Yamna has mentioned, I mean, precedents are, um, something that we really work towards at Earth Refuge um, and that, you know, should you win a case such as this one in, in a hypothetical sense, um, then there's kind of a stronger basis, of course, moving forward for, for future cases such as this. Um, I think strategic litigation is one avenue, but I think the reality is, as, as we've kind of been addressing, the speakers have been touching on throughout the whole event today, um, and, and even as Samuja was rightly saying, um, there are a lot of different channels for advocacy and, and maybe there is a strong argument that we should be pushing every single one of these channels in the way that we can. And I think in the legal realm, strategic litigation is one thing, um, you know, but there's so much more reform that has to, to happen there. For example, we have um, so many people showing up at borders who are not mentioning the relevance of climate change impacts or disasters in their asylum applications, um, but perhaps their story comes to be that they're coming from the, let's say, Central American dry corridor to the U.S.-Mexico border, and actually in the first instance it was um, rising aridity levels leading to the depletion and degradation of soil that was then felling crops, so maybe there was an initial movement from an urban, or a rural to an urban context in this case, and that it was in the urban context when a kind of more persecution-driven um, displacement occurred. So what we might see is that this person is arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border seeking asylum in the U.S. and is actually not mentioning the first instance um, that kind of pushed their displacement into the, the urban context in the first place. Um, so this is to say that there's kind of layers that have to shift transformations that are needed within the legal advocacy arena. Um, and I think this even boils down to something like legal aid. You know, how does that conversation look um, between the, the lawyer who's providing support for the case, um, you know, from the asylum seeker? Um, is climate change being mentioned there? There's not a precedent for it to be mentioned there when one is seeking asylum because currently there's no space for this type of protection. So I think this is one area where shift needs to take place, um, which also then can easily lend itself to a kind of... Um, training and education of those working in the legal services sector to kind of better understand this issue and how it might be relevant to these cases um, and not to push that it be kind of forged there but to kind of work to delicately see how it might be climate change impacts and disasters might be relevant to the displacement that you know maybe isn't kind of mentioned in the first instance by the asylum seeker and then there's the the judiciary, right, and the way in which judges are actually deciding these applications. And so far, again, there's kind of limited precedence for them to decide these generously, though, of course, there's a lot of cases, and Yamna can definitely speak more about this, but uh, a lot of cases at the moment where um, we're kind of watching to see what precedents might come from these with the hopes that, again, there could be some, um, again, kind of training or education um, around how these cases are being decided uh, with respect to the relevance of environmental factors. Um, so I would say these, in addition to litigation, um, in addition to, you know, there again, we're seeing people advocate for entirely new conventions. We're extending the scope of the 1951 convention. Um, we're seeing, obviously, policy advocacy. Um, that I think all of these things have to kind of come together to be complementary. And I think strategic litigation is kind of just one of the host of potential avenues. 
Um, but I think what it speaks to is kind of that need to address um, a much more kind of systemically felt issue. Um, and that if you kind of combine all of these advocacy forces together, maybe in a way we are kind of um, better advanced than it feels like we are in creating a kind of uh, responsive um, policy and law advocacy space to respond to climate induced displacement. And that it's rather the stratification amongst all of these spaces that makes us feel like, you know, why aren't we getting anywhere? Why aren't we seeing tangible results? But I also have to give a shout, of course, to Adlai at the Platform on Disaster Displacement, because I think the work you guys are doing to consolidate uh, what is being done and to share the best practices within that space is essential. And I think we probably need more kind of legal forums where we're and this is part of our kind of goal at, at Earth Refuge as well as the education piece of how are um, lawyers and advocates thinking about the relevance of climate induced displacement and how can we kind of train the next generations of generation of lawyers to think about this relevance um, and kind of add this to the to the task force I would say globally of trying to advocate and mobilize around preventing and avoiding protection related to the issue. So that's my swing at it, but maybe Yamna has thoughts. I think Lauren's answer is pretty comprehensive. Um, I only really have two uh, smaller points to make and sort of a side point. Um, so I think the key word in your question, Roshan, is leverage. I think that um, strategic litigation definitely can be leverage. It's a pretty sweeping action to take. Um, I think that the key obstacle uh, to strategic lit litigation is um, evidence gathering. And I think it's the main pitfall of uh, legal initiatives to solve climate migration. And that is because um, as we've repeated sort of again and again, this is a multifaceted issue. Climate migration doesn't look the same in every arena. Uh, there are lots of contributing factors. It is very rarely the sole factor driving movement. Um, and so when you have lots of things sandwiched, it's hard to sort of pick out the climate migration element and prove it to a um, worried judiciary um, and to prove that, you know, it deserves its own sort of arena of rights. So by that, I mean, you know, we can say, OK, um, activity in this country by this corporation affected you know, country B and its inhabitants, and they had no part to play in the environmental destruction that happened as a result. It's really hard scientifically to prove that and to um, pick it apart and isolate it from all the other surrounding elements or evidence. Um, there's some hope. Um, and by that, I mean, uh, I attended the Stockholm 50 conference in, in Stockholm um, at the beginning of June, and um, there was a panel where a number of um, Supreme Court justices and judges were discussing the environmental rule of law and how we can move forward. And they all said that um, we need to rely on the science um, in, in, in proving our decisions and in making decisions and in moving forward in this arena. And the second thing is that we do see some cases where uh, maybe it's not necessarily a climate migration um, uh, matrix, but the idea of accepting scientific evidence can be sort of ex was accepted in those areas and we can carry it over to climate migration. Um, so a particular case I'm thinking of is um, whaling in the Antarctic, which was heard before the International Court of Justice. And I think it was New Zealand, Japan, Australia. Two of them were involved in the case and one was intervening, um, but that should give you enough to Google it. Um, and the crux of this case is that the court accepted that scientific evidence could be used to prove causal links. So the uh, corporate activity of one um, country uh, was proven to affect another country and its inhabitants. Um, and that all, the case obviously was centered around whaling and not human movement, but um, the precedent remains the same and the idea remains the same. Um, and in terms of strategic litigation more generally, um, I think also one of the key obstacles is that there's no shortage of lawyers who want to litigate in the arena of climate migration, but rather there's a lack of a cohesive body of law for them to consult to even build a case. Um, and so we're trying to go a ways to address that at Earth Refuge by having established this database where our legal researchers look at um, 
cases that either directly or indirectly relate to climate migration and they analyze them through a climate migration lens. And the idea is to give lawyers sort of ammunition um, before they get started, but also to show them how different arguments can be transposed to a climate migration field. So I hope that answers your question somewhat. Thank you. Um, yeah, we are a little pressed for time. I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna try and squeeze in two questions. Um, Atle, um, I think we're just gonna try and ask you a question about Ro, uh, from Roshan about how international humanitarian organizations can better align their operational mandates and policy implementation with empirical research, which is kind of what Yana was talking about on climate mobility patterns, given its complexity and multifaceted nature and the need for context dependent local responses. I ask that you try to keep this as short as possible so we can ask one more question for everyone. Thank you. I, I am. It, it's hard to do that that in a minute or two. But I think from uh, um, uh, a perspective of humanitarian action, I think the first thing that we need to strengthen is our understanding of risks and and make sure that we are uh, much better uh, able to to monitor, project, and assess risks. I think the um, the humanitarian system has increased since its capacity to do anticipate action, early warning, and then, then trigger resources. I think that's that's a very good good element. But the, um, uh, the, the, the writing is on the wall uh, in the last IPCC reports, uh, and it suggests that if this is going to happen, we will be overwhelmed uh, by needs uh, in terms of what is the humanitarian system uh, able to, to deliver. So it must be a complete shift in, in, uh, in working methods, in tools to, to rather uh, reduce the situation that may lead to humanitarian need or be able to, to contribute that. So there's a completely um, need for a, for, for a, for, um, a, a risk-informed uh, planning and a, and a risk-informed uh, project cycle for, for humanitarian. I think when we um, talk about uh, uh, issues such as disaster displacement uh, for humanitarian is also to understand that this is very often a developmental issue. It's a development challenge that we see people being displaced. And that means it's really need to, to bridge that famous nexus we are talking about, uh, humanitarian work with, with development work and, and have a different uh, approach to how humanitarian actually relate with governments. It's not a conflict. It responsibility starts with the government. It ends with the government. You need to work on existing structure. So these are just some few few quick thoughts. I hope I, I was able to, to answer that. I, I'm not saying that humanitarian uh, system uh, has not advanced on these issues, but I think we are, if I may say we, because I also, my background is humanitarian, we, we are behind the curve. Uh, and, and with the accelerating risk landscape, uh, partly due to the adverse effect of climate change, we need to, to shift our, um, our, our risk-informed planning and um, response capacity. That was a very comprehensive answer for the short, unfairly short amount of time I gave you. Um, I think we'll just try to end on one more question, um, maybe just a brief answer from everyone still remaining. Tasneem had to go. Um, a little earlier. Um, this is from Emma. Uh, she asks, in your opinion, what are the largest research gaps appropriately addressing the rights protections for climate migrants? And I think this will be a good note to end on. Uh, whoever wants to go first, maybe Lauren. Yeah, that's a big question. Um, I mean, I think I think as a starting point, obviously, Earth Refuge is trying to respond to um, some of these gaps. So I would say, um, you know, if you, if you to give a shout out, we can drop a link in the chat as well. But that um, our legal database would be a good place to start to kind of think about the type of research that's needed um, in, in terms of um, kind of jurisprudence and the development of, of case law. Um, I would say also kind of comprehensive um, Spaces again. I, I know I alluded to the PDD before and the work that they're doing, but I mean this this kind of um, 
holistic space of bringing together kind of key pieces of, of legislation um, and of policies, you know, across the across the kind of protection side and the, and the legal side and, and also humanitarian and development policies. So from climate change adaptation policies, mitigation policies, disaster risk reduction, um, kind of all coming together in a, in a comprehensive sense. And I say this as well as a researcher in this realm who's kind of constantly having to you know, dip my toe in here and here and here to kind of assemble and pull things together a bit to get a kind of comprehensive idea um, of, of the overview of the policy landscape and of the legal landscape. I would say that there's not really a kind of uh, one-stop shop for, for any of these spaces and that this is also quite reflective of the stratification that we see with the different sets of actors in responding to this issue. Um, but this would be a big one. And then, of course, also the um, you know experiences, the lived experiences, um, and uh, the threats faced by um, communities. I think one really important thing that's often overlooked in discussions on climate migration uh, is voluntary immobility. You know, when communities actually want to stay, what is it that they need, and how might we support them? I think this is an area of research that um, really needs to be developed and. Obviously, that um, I think, as Tasneem was pointing out, the photo voice action research as being a way to, um, you know, hand the cameras over to those who are at risk and those who are being displaced and to have them document what is going on for them and to have that be the basis from which policy developments and legal developments are actually coming about. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Lauren. Um, does anyone else want to add anything or? Actually, yes. I, I think I just want to say there are huge gaps. And I think I used the word behind the curve. I think uh, this is very uh, dynamic. It's, uh, it's happening very quickly, uh, the, the risk landscape. So we need to, to catch up on our understanding of needs, different mobility forms. I think, Lauren, good point. You know, maybe one of the most dire consequences is that people will be trapped or not able to move out of harm's way. So, so we need to keep up, up that. I think, uh, I think it was you, Laurent, you showed some data from IDMC, very rudimentary. It talks about you know, the people that are displaced as an event. They have very little information about what happened to these people, what are their protection needs, did they find solution? We know that when we go back to disaster areas and we often find people in displacement still many years after so we need to 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 have the stamina to to keep uh, the research i think from our side and i think i want to be very honest on this we try to map effective practices we try to map you know good examples but we don't really know how effective these uh, policies and practices are so we really need to to have a much better understanding of what works and what actually protects people. And that means much more granular uh, granular research methods, much granular research. So just encouraging everyone to, to keep up the good research. And I also, as I alluded to the beginning, I think there are, and I think both Lauren and you also said is this definitional conceptual disagreement, trying to unpack what we are actually talking about. And, and I saw there was a question on myth, you know, there's a lot of myth in this area, you know, the North being overwhelmed by millions, uh, when the fact is that this is most likely gonna be South-South, gonna be internal. I think we tend to overstate climate change at, at times, you know, that mobility is very multicausal. So climate change is one element of, of a hazard, but what about other vulnerabilities and capacities and exposure that probably are far more important for the outcome of displacement or mobility. So I can give you our entire research agenda and get you going. So gaps are there. I, I really would like to stress that. Um, I'll just round up all the valid points that were make, made very quickly and just add a few more. Um, I think overarchingly, um, there are plenty of myths and it's, uh, sorry, gaps and myths um, and they are rooted in people sort of shying away or being entirely ignorant to the racialized nature of this issue. Um, people are more vulnerable to the issue of climate migration because of systems that were put in place to make them more vulnerable <laughs> to certain things. Um, and you need not be an activist to acknowledge it, but I think in moving forward with solutions, it's something that needs to be heated because otherwise we won't understand the impacts of the solutions we're trying to um, enforce. Um, secondly, 
it's uh, the, the fact that it's happening everywhere is really important to acknowledge. Um, so certain communities are rendered more vulnerable and of course it's happening more quickly in some places than others and obviously small developing island states are one of those places. Um, but you know, if you look at the extreme winter that hit Texas in sort of spring last year, if you look at the wildfires that are hitting the US now, the wildfires that are hitting Australia, the floods that are happening in the north of England, it's happening everywhere. And so it's it's very much on everyone's doorstep. Um, so there are definitely research gaps there. You know, uh, No one really assumes, or uh, lay people don't assume that it's happening in the developed world, but it is. Um, and I think a last gap promise um, is something that Tasneem spoke about, and that is militarization and securitization of borders. The funding um, that was discussed that is so desperately needed to actually move these solutions forward because money talks um, is so often being spent by uh, more wealthy governments on securitizing and militarizing their borders to prevent people from entering and by subscribing to those myths of you know millions of people coming to take jobs. Um, and by militarization, I mean like literally robots are being paid for and eye scanners and all of that stuff. So um, I think a lot of research needs to be done into how much is being spent there and where it could be spent more productively to mitigate and address the issue. And Todd Miller is um, a journalist who does a lot of work on that cross section. So yes, there are plenty of gaps and I will end it there. Thank you, everyone. And um, yes, agree with you. Um, I will say that uh, we are very much over time. Well, not that much over time, but I'd like to thank everyone for staying with us um, and for this interest in the topic. It was a truly insightful and educational discussion, at least for me, and I hope it's been similar for everyone else. And we have covered ambitiously a wide array of topics. Um, there's still much more ground to be covered. If you enjoyed this event and you'd like to attend similar ones, you can check out Earth Refuges website. They do a lot of advocacy work as well, um, as well as um, you know, our social media, which I'll include in um, the follow-up email. Um, I'd like to give a very big thank you to Lauren Grant, Yamna Kamel, Dr. Samudu Atapatu, Atle Solberg, Dr. Tasneem Siddiqui, as well as um, Dr. Isabel Schutz for coming in on such short notice to chair. Um, I'd like to also give a little self-congratulatory pat on the backs to, you know, our organizing teams, Earth Refuge and um, the Social Policy Green Impact team, um, the admin in the Department of Social Policy as well. Um, and also a big thank you for those of you who stayed here today and asked questions. Apologies that we couldn't get to every single question. Um, and thank you for those just who took the time of the day to listen. I hope you have a lovely, lovely rest of the day.